tomorrow Jerry goes in for surgery to have her shoulder replaced. She's following in my footsteps. Yeah. And uh, and uh, I said to her, I said, you know, there's, you know, we're not to be anxious. But how many times do we bring our anxieties with us? We bring our anxieties home. We bring our anxieties to church. We bring our anxieties with us like they're an extra set of, you know, extra set of keys or a wallet in our back pocket or a purse. And the reality is, is that God can tell us that we're to be anxious about nothing. But in everything, can anybody else fill that out, finish that off? With prayer and God's supplication, give thanks to the Father. With everything. And that's the joy about anxiety, is that we're to give it to God. Right, Jerry? Yep. But it's not easy, is it? It's not easy to give our anxieties over to God. It's not easy to hand Him the struggles and the troubles that we're walking with. It's not easy at times to say, God, here, take it. Because we tend to pull it back. Because it's comfortable. We tend to bring it back. So it's hard to leave it with them. But we want to do that this morning. As we enter into God's presence, we want to say, God, these are the things that I'm dealing with. They're yours. Allow me to hear you and not them. Allow me to focus on you and not on them. Our call to worship this morning is uh, from Colossians chapter 3, 15 to 17, out of the message translation. Sing out to God, and we will uh, do this responsibly. Dylan. Let the peace of Christ keep you in tune and in step with each other. Cultivate painfulness. Let the word of Christ Let us instruct and direct one another using good common sense. Let us sing, sing our hearts and love God. Let every detail in our lives, words, actions, whatever, be done in the name of the Master Jesus, thanking God for the Father every step of the way. We're so grateful to you, Father, today that we can bring to you all the things that lay on our hearts this morning. We can bring to you our anxieties and our worries and our concern. We can bring to you our joys and our celebrations. We can bring to you the things that are, that are uh, that anger us and tick us off. We can bring all these things to you, Father. We can lay them at your throne. And we're grateful that you, O oh God, take them. And this morning, we can bring nothing to you that you are not capable of handling, not capable of answering, not capable of dealing with. Thank you so much, O Lord, that you are capable. Fathers, we come before you as we listen and we uh, interact again with another one of our faces of faith. Father, let us learn from Joseph how to walk for you and walk with you. Fathers, our, as we worship this morning, we everything that we do, all the words that we say, all the attitudes of our hearts, bring glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We start by remembering that God is immortal and invisible, that God only wise. If we get that wrong, when we start our days, everything else falls by the wayside. God is always king. God is always righteous. Sherry, Ben, lead us.
we come to our time of confession this morning, we recognize that we do live in fearful times. We have fear of the future, fear of the present, fear of not knowing, and fear of knowing. We're surrounded with, with messages that elicit fear. From war to financial struggles, from family deaths to personal illnesses. This morning we recognize before we come before God, recognizing that fear is real. And that God is the one who can help us face uncertain times. Listen to the word of God from Psalm 34, verses 4 to 7. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Those who look to him will help for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation I prayed, and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles. For the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. Let's bring to God our fears silently and then together. Let's pray together. Dear God, we come before you living in a world that is a swirling mess of uncertainty. Fear is real, yet you have called us not to fear, and too often we fail at following this one simple command. Please forgive us. Dear Father, we also fail to look to you for the help we need, and instead of experiencing the joy you would have for us, we fall into the trap of grim desperation. Please forgive us. Dear Lord, we have been searching for answers in all the wrong places. Instead of coming to you with our troubles, our worries, our concerns and our grief. Please forgive us. Dear Savior, forgive us when we forget that you surround us and defend us, when we allow the worries of life to penetrate our hearts and minds, and prayer becomes the last option rather than the first choice. Please forgive us. Thank you, God, for answering our prayers, for freeing us from fears, for giving us joy, for listening to our cries, for saving us from our troubles, from surrounding and defending us, even when we don't realize it. We are a grateful people. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Sherry?
Bible reading this morning is, is in Genesis chapter 39. Genesis 39. This is not easy when you have a hand away from your hand. Yeah. <laughs> 
means no worries. It means no worries. It means no worries. And of course, we all know the story of the story of the Lion King. Simba, who was you know think he's all that and a whole lot more, and uh, he decides he's gonna he decides he, he's gonna take control of his life as a little cub, and uh, he goes and, and eventually he was he's he's trapped and by his uncle and watches his father die and then he runs off thinking that it's his fault to a foreign, to a strange land. And he meets up with these two irreverent characters. Timon and Pumbaa. Timon and Pumbaa. A little meerkat and a warthog. And of course we have these uh, two uh, characters that really influence young Simba's life in a, in a really interesting way. But their, their uh, mantra is Hakuna Matata, which means no worries. Now, do you know where the no worries comes from? Anybody? It's an Australian saying. And actually, if you, and I'm doing some research in it, uh, that is kind of the unofficial, unofficial motto of Australia is no worries. No worries. And we often use it because we, we, we say, Sherry says it a lot. If somebody says, oh, I can't, it's just no worries. And try to understand exactly what it means. Uh, it's really important. So the phrase has that Australian background, and it means do not worry about that, or that's all right, but it can also mean sure thing and you're welcome. I mean, how can you have two words that mean so many different parts, so many different expressions? But that's what it means. See, it focuses on that laid-back attitude of the Aussies, illustrating the important parts of their culture, such as amiability and friendliness, expectation of shared attitudes, a good humor, and above all, optimism. More of a casual optimism. And that's what they use, and that's where it comes out from. Now, our little friends in the story, Timon and Pumba, they were doing it because they were trying to get away from responsibility. But they learned a lesson. As eventually, Timon and Pumba and Simba went back to the Pride Lands, and they had to face Scar, his uncle, and say, oh, this isn't what's supposed to happen. And they freed that place from the from oppression. So all of a sudden, the laid-back attitude meant they had something to do. And I thought about that as I was reading the story of Joseph, particularly in this particular chapter, because Joseph really is a long, Joseph's story is quite a long uh, story. But I was reading it in the New Living Translation, and I really found it interesting because the same kind of expression is used twice in this passage. He is used at the end, uh, it's used when, when he's talking about Potiphar, that uh, Potiphar put everything in Joseph's care, and Joseph was in charge, he did not concern himself with anything. And in the, in the NLT, it actually says that, that, Joseph, that, that Potiphar had no worries. And then we look right to the end of this chapter, and again, it says that, that, God, that uh, God gave uh, blessings to Joseph when he was in jail, and the jailer put everything in charge, and the jailer had no worries. No worries. But yet, how many of us today are carrying around worries with us? How many of us are carrying around the anxieties of life? And they could be good things, they could be bad things, but we carry them around with us and we hold on to them. And sometimes those are a challenge for us to get over. So, no worries and following the presence of God do go hand in hand. Perhaps not that laid back Aussie, Aussie slang, but the idea that when we trust in God, we should have no worries. And we have the perfect example here of Joseph. We have the perfect example of what we need to do as believers to follow and to have a life like that is filled with no worries because we've given them all to God. Let's start with a few keys that come out about uh, no worries in a Christian life. And I, I, I really enjoy this. Because of course we find Joseph. We meet up with Joseph here at the beginning of chapter 39. And he is in the care of the Ishmaelites. Uh, probably care a little strong, a little bit too light for word. He was, a, he was a prisoner. He was a slave. And the Ishmaelites had bought him from his brothers. And they, were on, they went down to Egypt and now they sell him from uh, to Potiphar. There's a lot of different ideas of understanding of who Potiphar was, but Potiphar was a high-ranking official in Pharaoh's court. 
And that's all that really matters. He was a high-ranking official in Pharaoh's court. He had a lot of authority. He had a lot of uh, power. And as a result of that, he bought Joseph, and he had him as a slave in his household. But there's a, one, the first key that we begin to see out of this is that despite what God, what had happened in Joseph's life, despite his brothers getting angry with him, selling him into slavery, God was still with him no matter where he went. Verse, verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph. And that becomes the key understanding of what Joseph's life was. The Lord was with Joseph. See, no matter where he went, no matter what he would do, and over the next, from 39 to the end of the, this book, in Genesis chapter 50, we see God working powerfully through Joseph's life. Powerfully. And in situations that we scratch our head and go, I don't think so. God, that shouldn't work. But God was with Joseph. One of the first keys that we need to remember is that God, Joseph had found favor. And because he had found favor with God and God was with him, all of a sudden he found favor with Potiphar. We see that in verse 4. He found favor with the jailer in verse 21. And because of that, God had entrusted, God entrusted him and the jailer and Potiphar had entrusted to him great responsibility. Great. Now remember, he's a slave and then a prisoner. Do we trust slaves? Do we trust prisoners? Not necessarily. But God was with him. God was with him. The second key that I see in this passage, now mind you, there's an awful lot of stuff in here that I'm, I'm not touching on as we go along. The second key is that Joseph was a man of character. Joseph was a man of character. So we see him. He's uh, now in charge, second in command over all the house of Potiphar. Anything that Potiphar wanted, the only thing Potiphar worried about was what he was going to what he was going to fill his belly. I don't know. That sounds not like a bad case of worries for me. All I had to worry about was filling my belly. Sounds like vacation, doesn't it? <laughs> Regardless of that, regardless of that. So Joseph resisted something. Joseph resisted sin, and it's more important, he resisted temptation. And the most part of this chapter deals with how he dealt with Potiphar's wife, who seems, who shall remain nameless, because I don't know what her name was, and she only seemed to have one phrase in her vocabulary. Come sleep with me. Come sleep with me. So Joseph discovers that, and it says, and the Bible is very clear, that Joseph was well built and handsome, and his wife, and Potiphar's wife, took notice of him and said, What did she say? Come sleep with me. That's right. Yeah. Come sleep with me. That seems to all she wanted. But Joseph resisted. But if you notice in here, it wasn't just one time, it was over and over and over and over. That God, that Joseph had to resist the temptation of this woman. Now, the Bible doesn't expressly say about what she was like, but my guess is that she was probably a fairly attractive woman. She was probably had all the things that was necessary to make her look attractive. But he said no. He said no. He resisted temptation. He resisted it. He stayed away from it. Because he saw that it was relentless, always there, after day after day after day, until of course we see it at one particular point where he's in the house, nobody else is around, and she said again, "Come sleep with me." I'm trying to keep you awake. It's really happening on this warm July morning. So she said, "Come sleep with me," and he says, "No, I'm not going to do that." And he runs out of the house, and he leaves his book behind. And from that point on, all of a sudden, Joseph goes from second in command to a prisoner. But Joseph focused on his character. He, God blessed. Joseph, Joseph's focus was always on God. Joseph's focus was always on God. And it's really interesting that he, what he says here, and we'll get to, that, we'll get to this in just a moment. But it's really interesting. Because his dedication to God was so significant that he would allow nothing else to take his vision off of what God wanted him to do. 
what God had planned for him to do. Remember back to the dreams that he had had? God had told him that something would happen there, and it hadn't happened yet. And God was still using him. God was still building him. God was still working on him, and he kept that focus absolutely powerfully in front of him at all times. So he knew where the boundaries line, the boundary lines were drawn. He knew that it was not Potiphar that he was sinning against, or Potiphar's wife that he was sinning against if he gave him the temptation. What does it say in there? He would be sinning against God. Joseph knew that God was the one that he had to worry about, not Potiphar and not his wife. Because if he had let, if he had gone, let down the temptation and gone with her, God, it was God that he would disappoint. Him. It was God that mattered. And that was important for him. He knew where his boundary lines were drawn. And his boundary line was, I cannot disappoint. I cannot sin against my God. I can do an awful lot of other things, but I will not, cannot sin against my God. And the second thing we see here is that he knew where his boundary lines were drawn with Potiphar and his wife. Joseph knew that woman was off balance. Period. God, he said, my master's given me charge of everything else except you. The only thing that was off balance. Now, it doesn't say whether, jo- whether, the, whether Potiphar said that or whether Joseph just knew what God wanted him to do and said, this woman is off balance. Because of his relationship with God, because he knew God's boundaries in his life, he knew the boundaries with others. He knew that this was something that he could not and would not do. But he also knew where his boundary lines were with the jailer. With the, uh, so it says in verse 22 that the warden put Joseph in charge of all of those things, all those held in prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. Again, he knew his boundary lines. All of a sudden, Joseph, who had gone from slave to second in command in the Potiphar's house, went down to prisoner and was bound up to second in command in the jail. But he knew where those boundary lines fit and what he could get away with because he kept his focus on God. And if we were to go ahead in Genesis chapter 41, we would also see again when Joseph had gone from treasured son to slave to second in command in Potiphar's household to jailer to the jail raid back to second in command in the jail. Now, in chapter 41, he's now second in command over all of Egypt. That's a pretty good ride. And in that, Joseph, or Pharaoh says, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. The whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh put, took his signet ring from his finger, put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in four ropes of vine and put a gold, gold chart, chain around his neck. And he had him put, uh, he had him ride in the chariot as his second in command. And the people shouted, made way. Thus he was put in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Because Joseph knew where his boundary lines were with God, he could also know where his boundary lines were with Egypt. God had continued to put him in places where his challenge, where it would be challenges to see how he would deal with it. And in every way, he always did the right thing. And it comes back to the beginning. He kept his focus on God. He kept his focus on God. And we can see as we move from dealing with Pharaoh to dealing with his brothers. As many times people go, ooh, now I can have some fun. My brothers made sport of me. My brothers sold me off to a slave. I'm going to get back at them. He knows where his boundary lines are with his brothers. He focused on his character. Because his character is what matters when everything else is gone. Now the third thing I want to look at before I get into a few application aspects is that Joseph trusted God. So he kept his eyes focused on God, but he trusted him. 
He knew that God had a plan for him. He knew the things that God was going to do. Despite the challenges of hateful brothers and human trafficking and slavery, vicious temptations, jail, being forgotten, he saw God's hands at work. I mean, when you look at that story about how things went up and down for Joseph, you recognize that that is not just your average Joe. Pun intended. Thanks, Katie, you got it. I appreciate that. It's not just your average Joseph. He's a guy that trusted that God who led him would continue to lead him. He trusted God. There's nothing that he wouldn't do for him. He saw God's work, God's handiwork from the beginning through his, through dreams. He saw it through his own dream, through the cupbearer and the baker's dream, through Pharaoh's dreams. He knew that God was doing something as he interpreted these dreams. He saw it through trials. As he was thrown into the, into the cistern, as he was sold for a slave, as he became a prisoner, he saw it. He saw God leading him through all of these things. He also saw it through the blessings. He had gone from favorite son to second in command of one of the largest, one of the largest nations in the area. Blessings. God had been there. And remember, we looked at blessings a number of weeks ago, and we said the blessings are not the monetary aspects, but the blessings are God caring for and looking after his people. And Joseph, despite going through ups and downs in his life, God was always looking after him. He saw it through the challenges that were there. And he saw it even through death, the death of his father, and even through his own death. If we look at Genesis chapter 15, Joseph said to his brothers, and remember, he knew this from the beginning. Don't be afraid. I am in the place of, am I in the place of God? You intended harm, but God intended it for good. He understood what God was doing. And he had his trust in God. Then we read in Hebrews chapter 11, which has been our, our, our sort of our, our case for this, this series. It was by faith that Joseph, when he was about to die, said confidently to the people of Israel that they would leave Egypt. He knew God was doing something. And they actually said, take my bones with me, with you, and bury me in, in the promised land. God was in control. And Joseph trusted God. Now, what are some of these, how do we translate some of these into some no worries in our lives? I mean, the first thing I think we need to be reminded of is that God is always with us. Jesus himself said in John chapter 14, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. For all of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we always, every day, all the time, without fail, have the presence of the Holy Spirit living within us. Always. Always. Even when we do things we ought not to, even when we get worried and anxious, even when things look impossible, the Holy Spirit is always with us, always guiding us, always there for us. So we know God is with us through the Holy Spirit. We also know that God is with us because of others around us. We see that as we watch God work in the lives of each other. As God directs and guides, we go, that's what, that's what that looks like. That's what it looks like when God begins to change someone. Ken gave Katie a gift uh, this week. And as Katie comes in chugging in with her, her pottery mug, and then she gave him a, a, a mug on the outside. It's got the, this, the, the, uh, the whole uh, the armor of God is written on the outside of this mug. And she can take that with her when she's going about, she's reminded because of her brother Ken who said, remember, the whole armor of God is there. So God placed us in, commun in the community so that we can build one another up and feel and know that God is with us all the time. The second thing we need to focus on need is to focus on God. Unfortunately, we don't have some of the ups and the downs. Unfortunately. Fortunately, we don't have some of the ups and the downs that Joseph did. I don't know, when was the last time any of us was sold, uh, uh, sold into slavery? Hands, anybody? 
No? Okay. Um, the reality is, is that we don't have it like Joseph had it. But we too need to keep our eyes and our focus on God and God only. In this world, there's a lot of things that can be distracting. A lot of things. And God knows that they're there. But our focus always needs to, needs to be strictly put onto God. So we need to focus on God and build our character. If we look at Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5, it says, not this, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Sometimes we won't like that. Because we know that suffering produces uh, perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character hope. God wants to build in us character like Joseph. So that as Joseph went through life, when Joseph faced struggles, we can know where our boundary lines lie because we have focused on, on God and we have kept God always at the center of who we're looking on. We know that what God said, we know what God said in the Old Testament, what he said through the prophets, what he said through, through the other Old Testament writers, what he said through Jesus, what he said through the apostles, what he said through the other New Testament writers. Keep our eyes focused on what God wants to do, on what God is doing. When we look at what God did, then it keeps our boundary lines clear. Now we're struggling with boundary lines. The best place for us to look is none other than Jesus himself. Jesus knew his boundary lines. He knew what he had to do and what he should do. And he trusted God implicitly. People say, well, yes, he was God. Absolutely, he was God. But we can still learn from this man who is fully human and fully divine about keeping in our lane, about watching our boundary lines and knowing that God is the one that we need to be focused on. Always keeping our eyes on him in every case. Because the truth is, if we're focusing on God, the rest of the place gets a little bit cloudy, and that's okay. All of a sudden, the temptations become not easier, not easy, but easier. All of a sudden, the trials and the struggles we walk through are a little bit shallow, or there's help with us as we walk through those. That's the great part about being able to know that we keep our focus on, <clears throat> on God. We need to remember, so remember this. As we walk through life, trials and temptations are a part of regular life. What Joseph experienced may be a little bit more than what any other one of us will experience. But I'm guessing that there are times when we have been tempted. Yes? Or no? We're all perfect? <laughs> I don't think so. I'm not perfect. But there's temptations that we face. Whether it's to flip the middle finger at somebody who cuts you off on the road. Whether it's to, uh, uh, you know, fudge on our income tax a little bit. Whether it's to uh, lie to our spouse about what we've been doing. Ice cream. Whether, <laughs> whether it's to uh, ice cream. <laughs> oh, okay. Katie, Katie, Katie. Yeah, I shouldn't have ice cream either. <laughs> the reality is, is that we need to remind ourselves that God knows God sees. God understands. Temptations are a part of life, and we will always face them. So we focus on God. There we go. So we always focus on God. And we need to remember also to trust God. For Joe, I put that third in my keys for Joseph, but really it should be first. We focus on God and we trust God. We trust God. God has never let us down. God has never given us cause for ever to doubt him. And I would imagine that Joseph might have had a few times in his life where he says, gee, are you really doing this, God? When I'm bound in the back of a chariot or on the back of a caravan being towed to Egypt, are you still in control, God? Yes. Are you still in control, God, when I'm rotting in prison? Yes. Are you still in control, God? Yes. Are you still in control when my health fails? Yes. Are you still in control when there's problems with my family? Yes. Are you still in control when I lose my job? Yes. 
Are you still in control when it looks like my, my retirement funds might not, not last until I die? Yes. God is still in control. God is still trustworthy as we walk through all of that. And that was exactly what Joseph learned. That's when he held close to him to trust in God. And we can do. If we take anything from Joseph, and this is going to be our last message on Joseph, we're going to move on to Moses next week. But as we move on, we remind ourselves that as a face of faith that we can look at, here was a man who walked through incredible ups and downs. And he stayed true to God. We can walk through ups and downs. And we too can stay true to God. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful to you. Grateful for people like Joseph, who are an example to us of faith in the midst of highs and lows of life. We're grateful to you, Joseph, for who was willing to focus and keep his eyes on you. Our prayer this morning is, God, no matter what we go through, no matter what things we are facing, help us to keep our eyes on you. Help us to keep our focus on you. Help us to keep trusting you. No matter what temptations, no matter what difficulties come our way, let us keep trusting you, the one who loves us and gave himself for us. Father, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As the band comes forward, Remember this, that our next song it does speak about some of the difficulties and struggles. And the reality is, is that as we come before God, we do so knowing that he is always there for us. And we bless him because of it.
You'll be wondering why I'm doing this, is because I'm going to go over and see Jamie about a new headset, because the one we have, not working quite as well as we ought to, so this is a little easier for many of us, many of you. So, as we come to our time of prayer this morning, this is going to be fun. <laughs> We come to our time for this morning. We do want to remember um, Kate and Jim Moore. Uh, uh, Jim lost his mom. We've been praying for her over the last number of months as she has been in hospice care. We lost. He lost his mom on uh, on Tuesday evening, and uh, then 36 hours later, his dad also passed in the presence of Jesus um, at Mailey Manor. So. <clears throat> That was a tough week for Jim and his siblings as they watched both his mom and dad pass away. So we want to keep the DeBoer family in our prayers as they walk through this week of grief. Also, uh, as a result of that, uh, there was, will be a funeral service for both Martha and Casey DeBoer on Monday over at, uh, over at St. George's Anglican Church. So that will be taking place on Monday over there at 11 o'clock with a meditation about an hour before. So if anybody's interested in going, um, that would be great. And I'll be over there as well. But it's great that we can lift them up. And, and we have this knowledge that uh, both Martha and, and Casey were both uh, dedicated followers of Jesus. I know they were. And uh, we pray. I know Bob had a chance to pray with Martha a couple of times before she passed. And, uh, and she had a deep faith, so we do. And I, I would, uh, Casey would come out to uh, uh, to some of the services over at Bailey Manor, and he would just belt out the old hymns. His dementia had taken away a lot of his recognition of people, but boy, when the songs, when those hymns, when we sang those hymns, he would belt them out. He would sing with all of his might. And uh, they weren't expecting him to pass, um, but. Uh, God has some other things that are, we don't understand. So we pray for the poor family uh, during this week, particularly. Other things we can pray for this week, pray for today. Jerry? Our sister Jenny, who seems to be yes. feeling a little unwell, as first tells me, and, and seems to be exhausted. Pray that she feels better. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and sometimes life life can get even the good things. So, isn't it? Even the good things can sometimes be wearing. And uh, spending a week out in British Columbia can still be, even though it's good, you can still go. Oh, you get tired. So, we'll definitely pray for Jenny. And please tell her that we're lifting her up in prayer when when you see her in a little bit there, Bruce. Other things we can pray for. So she's passing out. Yeah, she can be just walking and just down. All right. Whew. That's tough. So definitely pray for hope that God will illuminate the doctors and, and the technicians to find out what's going on. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Mark just stepped out there for a moment, but we want to pray for Mark. Mark is going to be starting going on a trip. Uh, uh, his sister arrives a week from tomorrow, and then he heads out. Uh, a couple of days later to British Columbia, and he's going to go on a cruise up to Alaska with his sister and his cousin, or his nephew and niece, and family. So Mark's looking forward to having a great time with his family. Mark likes, loves to travel. He and Marion traveled an awful pile before she was in, before she was in the nursing home. So we'll definitely be praying for Mark as he gets ready and travels. So it's always challenges for Mark as he's traveling, but he's looking forward to it. Other things we can pray for? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And all of a sudden, the, the, the Tinder cave became Tinderier. All of a sudden, I don't know if that's a word, but anyways, all of a sudden, the, the, the unrest or the, 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 the struggle became even bigger yesterday with the, with the assassination attempt on Donald Trump. So we do want to pray for our brothers and sisters in the, in the, in the country south of us that there would be some peace that would reign in that, in that place. I'm, I'm glad I'm not American. Um, I'm glad I'm not American. 
I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm Canadian. Our, our politics aren't always that good either, but, but I'm glad I'm not American. That's just not where I would like to. That's, that's tough. So I'll pray for our American friends. Thank you, Dorothy, for that. I just feel that uh, we are becoming a little gangway with the number of shootings and things that are taking place in the cities. That um, why do we feel that that's the answer to everything? Is to be people? I just... We don't like you taking out? Yeah. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes the best thing is to say we don't. If we're having a problem with it, let's take it to God. And we bring it to God first and allow Him to be the one that works out the situation. Okay, I'd like to ask Pray for my friend Marge. She has COVID. Marge? Marge, yeah. Marjorie, yeah. Marge? She has COVID. Yeah, I was. She called me on Thursday and told me she had COVID, and I had been with her right Saturday before, so when we were diagnosed. Okay. You're okay. <laughs> we'll definitely pray for March. Definitely pray for also, we want to pray for Jan. I think Jan is probably getting ready to travel back home, I think, sometime this week. Rich is coming home on Friday. So pray for Jan as she's coming back from Greece. Saw a few pictures and it looks like she was having a fabulous time. She was hoping she might find a young Greek guy there. That <laughs> But it's good, it's good to have Jan back. I, I think of the, the homes, though. The yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes, thank you about that. Thanks as well for that. Yeah, the, uh, that oh, we've all heard, we've all heard rumors. Um, yes, they're all terrible. So we want to pray for all that are involved in that situation because it's just, none of it's pretty. None of it's nice. Um, we're missing our friend Doug this morning. Yeah. And he celebrated his 91st birthday this week. That's right. And oh, Ernest yes. said he wasn't going to come today because he was afraid that we could sing happy birthday. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what we ought to do? We ought to get that car as you go and stand in front of the house and sing happy birthday. I'm going to sing happy birthday to Doug in front of his, in front of his house. You know what? The best thing we can say. Pardon? We can always sabotage them. That's right. We can always get them. We can dodge one, we can dodge one. <laughs> but we are grateful for Doug. We're grateful for his passion. We're grateful for his humor. Uh, grateful for his stories. And uh, we look forward to seeing him again next week. But we, if you have a chance, wish him a happy birthday. Yes. Give him a shout out. Say, hey, happy birthday, Doug. And thank you very much this week. Let's come before God, shall we? Let's bring these things to him and to God in prayer. Father, we're grateful to you today. Um, in the midst of a world that seems to be out of control, we look at what's going on south of the border, we look at what's going on over in the Middle East, we look at what's going on in Russia, we look, look, about, look at different places in our world and go, oh God, what's happening? We are so grateful, God, that you know what's happening and we can trust you. When it seems like things are falling apart, it seems like fear is rampant, we can trust you. And when we trust you, we are dependent on you, and we know that you are there. So, Father, this morning, as we face unknowns in our homes, in our lives, traveling, grieving, Father, we leave these at your throne, oh God. We give them to you as a physical act. We give them to you, and we say, God, these are yours. We don't want to take them back again. Father, thank you. Thank you for taking them from us. Thank you for being the one who knows the end from the beginning. We don't have any idea why it was 36 hours between Martha, Martha and Casey dying. But there was. God, you called them both home in the same week. Thank you. We pray for your comfort and peace to be with Jim, to be with and Catherine to be with Marjorie, to be with Stephen, as they walk through the difficulties of this week that they have come through and yet still are going through. Be with them tomorrow as they prepare to, uh, to prepare, bury both their parents in one day. 
Be with them, Father, as they walk through the, the, the days and weeks of grief that follow after. Give them your comfort and your peace. Father, we also want to uh, want to pray for our, our dear sister Jenny. We miss her laugh, we miss her smile, we miss her hug. We miss, uh, we miss all of the warmth that is there. And we pray, Father, that you would bring, you would give her the strength and the revitalization, Father, as she's a little down, a little under the weather. Uh, rejuvenate her. Enthuse her, enthuse her. Give her your strength this week. Father, we also lift up uh, hope and pray for her as she is wanting to find out why she's going to be, be with the doctors, the nurses, technicians, as they are probing and figuring and trying to find out what's happening. Guide them to the right spot. Move their thinking in the right direction so that they can find a reason. Be with hope as she's living in the midst of the unknown and the uncertain. Father, we are grateful that you are there in the midst of the unknown. And give, uh, give Karen your peace as she looks and sees her, her granddaughter is, is concerned, rightfully so. Give her peace. Father, we pray as well for Mark as he's traveling uh, next week. We pray that you give him peace as he gets ready. We pray that you help him as he prepares. And allow that trip to go well with all the different planes and all the different flights that have to happen. Guide them all, guide them. And even as she comes out here, as she flies back with Mark, as they get on the boat, as they, as they enjoy their time together as a family, guide them, Father, in your name. Father, we also want to pray for Jan as she's traveling and getting ready to come home. Thank you for a good time she's had in Greece. We pray that you bring her home safely. We look forward to seeing her again when she's back home. Give her good journey mercies on the way. Father, we want to pray for Marge and pray uh, that you would uh, allow her to get over this bout of COVID. Quickly, uh, may it not be that hard or difficult on her. May she, may she also know that you are there with her even in the midst of this. Father, we thank you for that. Thank you so much for all the things that he is, for his uh, enthusiasm, for his, his uh, joy, for his stories, the many stories that that has. Thank you for the way his faith has been working in life in all the ways through 91 years. So, Father, we pray that you bless him. This week, as he celebrates his birthday, we pray that you would guide him, that you would encourage him to strengthen him. Father, we do also want to pray for what's happened down in Holmesville and the families that are involved. And we, we just pray, Father, for some kind of peace and healing in the midst of a tragedy that should have never happened. So we pray, Father, that you would guide him. We pray that you would provide people with wisdom and, and insight in how this, and how to be able to bring along healing. Because I don't know what that looks like. So we pray for the families that are involved. Pray for the, 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 young, the young person that's uh, this charged. We pray, Father, for the family that's grieving. We ask for your peace to be a part of it. And Father, that leads me to my last thoughts. And that's, I pray, Father, for our friends south of the border. I pray for the tinder keg and that it's gotten drier and more, more out of control. I pray, Father, that you would bring peace into that country. I pray that you would bring hope to that country for the many that are probably going, oh, I don't know what to do. So, Father, I pray that you would be with them. I pray that you would thank you for keeping uh, safe the, the uh, candidate. And I pray that you would, Father, uh, heal, allow the healing to happen quickly in his life. But I also pray, Father, that you would be a part of all the difficulties that are fraught in this election down there. Father, may your peace reign. I don't know what that looks like, but may your peace reign. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you that we can lift all these things before you in prayer. And now, Father, we lift them and we leave them with you. We don't take them back. We leave them. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. A few announcements as we uh, finish off our service for our last for our last message here. Where am I? There I am. I'm trying to get the right. Come on, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> it's just not going to go for me. Anyway, anyways, a few announcements as we as we conclude our service. Uh, Bible study. We're not having Bible study this week. I have to be in uh, in Cambridge for a six month checkup on my shoulder. Six months. In six months from now, you're going to be putting your hand up. Yay! 
So I'll be there. So but we will be having Bible study a week from Wednesday uh, at 1 30. There will be prayer meeting on Thursday at 1 30 here. Uh, also, we talked about, uh, we voted a number of weeks back to, uh, to look at the, re look at the, the, um, the decision we came to in June. And the suggestion of a date would be Friday, July 26th at 7 p.m. to revisit that discussion. So um, if anybody, if we're okay with that, great. If there's a problem, a few of us can't be here, just let me know so we can reschedule it. It's not like we're under a time crunch to do so, but we want to be able to, to talk about it and work it through. So I'm suggesting the 26th, which is a week from Friday, but if there's anybody has a, say, no, can't make it, or a bunch can't make it, then we'll just reschedule it. It's not a problem. But let me know. I can't, I, I can't read minds. That skill left me. I never had that skill. <laughs> Ask Sherry. I never had that skill. <laughs> I never had that skill. Um, we had a great time on Tuesday with our baptism Q&A, and it looks like we may be having five people baptized, if, or maybe even more. If you're interested in some of you and say, I'd love to do this, and you haven't ever been baptized, uh, let's talk, talk to me, and we can, we can still work it out. We're still a month or so away from that baptism service. Also, that reminds me, Church at the Beach is on the 25th of August, and that's when we will have our baptism service, and it's going to be a great time together as we go down to the lake and celebrate to there um, in front of everybody, in front of our community. After Church Fellowship, there is After Church Fellowship today, but uh, we need some more names on that back list. So if, on your way out today, if you're passing by and write your John Hancock, I don't know why we say that. But anyways, <laughs> write your name down there, because if you write John Hancock, there's no John Hancock here, and he's not going to provide food. <laughs> It'd be great for you to supply some days for us as that. Um, this, this coming Friday night, uh, we are having, uh, we are, Sherry's hosting a fundraising dinner for, uh, she's, been, she's going to be riding 300 kilometers in the month of August to raise money for St. Kitts Hospital. So we're having downstairs on Friday night a spaghetti dinner. Sherry's hosting this. Um, we're all helping, but she, it's to go towards her fundraising for St. Kitts Hospital and those kids that are dealing with cancer so that she can meet her goal or deadline of uh, getting uh, $500 in, uh, in pledges for cash. Four. So if you're not busy on Friday night, you come here uh, from five, 5 to 7 for a, a, a delicious spaghetti dinner and a dessert. And uh, there's, no ch there's not a charge, it's by donation. So whatever you feel you'd like to pay, that's what you pay. So that'll be this Friday from 5 to 7 p.m. downstairs. That's not a church event, it's not our own thing we're doing. So, But it's to help support for, uh, help support uh, Sherry and her ride. Because we're going to be riding 200 kilometers in four days in early August. And then we're going to put another 100 kilometers on after that. So we're looking forward to that very much. And I think that's all the announcements that I have. Is there anything else, Dorothy? All right. Sisters in Christ. I think. Yeah. Yes. Tuesday. Sisters in Christ, Tuesday. Yeah. One-ish. Yeah. One-ish. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're very definite. One-ish. <laughs> But it's going to be great to have that together. So keep that in mind, ladies, sisters in Christ, on Tuesday and morning, or Tuesday afternoon. All right. Ben, let us, let's come together and worship as we leave here. Because when we know that when Joseph knew that God was with him, God, Joseph trusted God. Joseph kept his eyes focused on God. He rejoiced that God is king. And we can too.
salvation is responsive. It's up on the screen from Colossians 3. Let the message about Christ and all its richness fill our lives. We teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. 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 We